The next one is the biogenic amines, um, norepinephrine. Um, I just have a picture here comparing epinephrine from norepinephrine. The main point that I think is interesting is that this little methyl group is the difference between norepinephrine and epinephrine. So it's either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the receptor type. I find that to be quite interesting. Um, it acts indirectly via a second messenger system. You, you see that mostly with things that are protein-based or, or uh, water-soluble. They tend to be, not always, but they tend to be acting via a second messenger system. Um, at the central nervous system, you can find it in the brain and parts of the limbic system, obviously. The sympathetic nervous system, we've talked about that pretty much in good detail. Um, it's a feel-good neurotransmitter. It's released with amphetamine use. And then it, this is actually interesting. Before they came out with Prozac and Zoloft and all that stuff, they treated depression with tricyclic antidepressants, so things that had three cycles, three rings to it. And uh, its removal from the synapse is blocked by tricyclic antidepressants and cocaine. So if we're doing these drugs, we are going to be increasing the concentration of norepinephrine. Next to the biogenic amines, we have dopamine. And here you can see the structure of it over here on the right. And again, just like many of his other ones, it's either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the receptor type. It's the receptor that determines the physiological effects, not necessarily the neurotransmitter. So obviously, protein salt, if it's water soluble, it tends to act via a second messenger system. I really don't know off the top of my head whether or not the structure is uh, water soluble. It looks like it's seeing all these polar groups here, but I'd have to actually sit down and count it. Um, it's very important in having fine controlled motor movement. So it's found in the central nervous system at the substantia nigra. Hopefully you watched that video of Gregory Petso's amazing eye biology podcast. Uh, the hypothalamus to help, you know, with um, other parts of other pathways as well. The extrapyramidal system, think about uh, pyramidal cells. This is just a part of, of advanced uh, motor movement. In the parasympath, uh, I'm sorry, in the peripheral nervous system, it plays a role in the sympathetic nervous system as well. Um, whenever people have a, a very good feeling, a good event happens in their life, a lot of dopamine tends to get released. It's a feel-good neurotransmitter. Also, its release is enhanced by amphetamines. I think somewhere it says that if you're doing meth or cri uh, crystal meth or cocaine, you're having like 10 times the natural possibility of dopamine release. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you should do meth, but that sounds like an amazing experience. Um, its reuptake is blocked by cocaine, so it stays in, in, the, in the synapse a little bit longer. Deficient in patients with Parkinson's disease and increased in patients with schizophrenia. Now, the problem I have with this is that a lot of people will say that schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease are just two points of a continuum, and that's why I can't stand psychologists. I'm sorry to say that. There's this thing called molecular mechanisms. You should look them up. The mechanism for schizophrenia, I don't know what it is. I don't think I found a lot of good papers that have published have actually understand what the underlying molecular mechanism is for schizophrenia. But Parkinson's disease, uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, all of those things have a clear, defined, underlying mechanism. And in Parkinson's disease, like Gregory Petso is talking about, it's that buildup of alpha-synuclein. Now, what causes the buildup of alpha-synuclein, that's up for debate. Mr. Pesto thinks that it's a uh, caspase activity. I've seen Susan Lindquist give talks about, um, you know, heat shock proteins playing a role in that. But schizophrenia is, com I, I don't, I've never read something that says that schizophrenia is the result of protein clumping. This is the difference between a description and an explanation. Sure, Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia have similar symptoms, but I do not think that they are part of a continuum. And certain professors will say that they are, and that's why I just don't like psychologists. Anyways, I'm moving on to my point there. The next one is known as serotonin, um, 5-HT. You don't really need to know that outside of this class. That's more or less a biochemistry thing. It's mostly inhibitory depending, I don't think I mentioned on it, uh, on the receptor. On the receptor. I can't write. Hopefully you can just hear me though. Um, it tends to act indirectly via a second messenger system. It's found in the brainstem, hypothalamus, limbic system, pineal gland, I found that interesting, cerebellum, and then spinal cord, okay? Um, and so one of the things that's, uh, it also plays a role in is regulation of mood, appetite, sleep cycle, and uh, its activity is blocked by LSD, uh, and then it's actually enhanced by MDMA. Ecstasy is basically just an SSRI, Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor on steroids. It's a supercharged version of it, and it can have some very interesting effects. If you'll notice with this, especially the limbic system, 
I've, I haven't actually done MDMA. I don't think anyone should. It's, it's, it has some neurotoxic abilities, but I've heard nevertheless that when you do it, you can smell colors and you have very different um, experiences with that. Um, in terms of it actually playing a role in uh, mood, appetite, sleep cycle, I think it's interesting that the pineal gland is included in that with dimethyltryptophan, which is also explained why people who do MDMA have those weird trip-like uh, experiences. Um, but what's interesting to me is that it's used so much with SSRIs or used so much to treat depression. Um, and I don't really think that that's the best way to go about doing that. So over here in this corner, I have a picture of Patch Adams, the real Patch Adams. And he has often talked about the fact that he doesn't actually think that SSRIs are actually going to treat people who have depression. He thinks that depression is, um, like most psychological diseases, are far too complex to have just one screwed up biochemical pathway. And I agree with that because when you look at what depression is, I'm not saying that people can't get you know depressed and can't be in a situation where they need to get help. Of course they do. But th I'm not saying that it is a clear cut underlying biochemical problem, okay? It's not a decrease in serotonin, okay? They're just giving serotonin in the hopes that it might actually uh, improve the symptoms. It's, it's, it's completely arbitrary whether or not someone is diagnosed with depression. You walk into your doctor's office, you say, you feel sad, okay? If I were to walk into my doctor's office and say, I feel dizzy, he's not gonna start giving me insulin because he thinks I'm a diabetic, okay? There's not a single quantitative, non-arbitrary diagnostic test that are used for depression. Um, and even then, when you look at people who have, you know, relatively symptoms of low serotonin, that may or well be correlative, or is that a causative type of relationship? We just don't really know. But anyways, we do know for a fact that serotonin plays a role in regulation of mood, and so that's why they're giving it to patients in hopes that it will actually do something. Um, I actually have no idea about the mechanism behind Prozac outside of uh, as an SSRI, how it crosses the blood-brain barrier and what the systemic effects of it are. Anyways, the next one is histamine, and you're all probably very familiar with that if you live where I live, in a desert where there's lots of dirt and stuff in the air. <laughs> it's either excitatory or inhibitory, again, depending on the receptor type. Hopefully that has driven, I've driven that concept home. It acts indirectly via a second messenger. It's found mostly in the hypothalamus, but also plays a very large role with learning and memory formation, wakefulness. Um, it, it's, you know, it stimulates gastrointestinal activity and plays a role with inflammation slash vasodilation of, of the, the whole inflammatory process which you have with mast cells. Mast cells have one function and that really is to initiate inflammation responses with the use of histamine. So let's just talk about this receptor type issue here. So obviously in the brain it plays a role in learning and memory and that's why people who again have uh, taken uh, any histamines are prone to having problems like Alzheimer's, trouble with memory, trouble with all that stuff here. And this is stuff that your doctor probably won't tell you, but antihistamines are very, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be used. Inflammation is a huge problem, but there are some side effects. Wakefulness, Benadryl always tends to have a sedative-like effect. Paracrine, gastrointestinal activity. If you've ever taken something like a drug, like, I don't know, Zantac or uh, Pepsid, these guys actually work by inhibiting histamine. They block the histamine at your stomach, which reduces the amount of stomach acid as well. And then obviously inflammation is the most common thing that we think about when we think about histamine, right?